your breath just to keep breathing. I need your voice just to keep on dreaming. I need your love to never go away. Hi, my name is Donna Swanson. I'm the Executive Director at Focus Alternative Learning Center, a treatment center in um, Canton for individuals on the autism spectrum and today we're shooting our focus on autism show and I have the privilege to have three mothers with us who are going to open their hearts and souls and uh, let you know what it's like to be the parent of a child on the autism spectrum. Um, first we're going to talk with Kim um, from who happens to live in Plainville mm -hmm. and she's the mother of a brilliant young man, Dan. Mm -hmm. Dan. Um, welcome Kim. Thank you. Um, just out of, you know, how was it, what was it like to find out that your child had autism and how did you know and what, what was different? Um, Dana wasn't diagnosed until he was almost 10. And prior to that, he was given a variety of diagnoses, um, the most popular being the sensory integration disorder. Yep. And he had a lot of um, textile sensory issues. Um, very selective with his foods. Um, things needed to be in a certain way, in a certain pattern, a certain flow to every single day. Um, but he was very bright. He was always a very bright, intellectually bright child. So I wasn't immediately thinking he was on the autism spectrum because that wasn't how I had been raised to believe mm -hmm. autistic children behaved. But you knew he was different. But I knew he was off. There was just a little something off about him. Um, and um, I happened to pick up a book in a parent section of the library that talked about Asperger's, which I've never heard of before, and that it was a form of autism. Um, and there was a checklist inside, and Daniel hit all the points. And Daniel was my only child at that time, so perhaps I didn't see it. And at the age of 10, he was homeschooled, so there wasn't really a lot of school intervention or, or early diagnosis. So um, we saw out a professional, and um, she did agree he did have Asperger's. And I was very excited for that label. Not that I was excited to see my son labeled, but now that we kind of knew we're circling the airport, we can make a landing and kind of make a plan of care. Yep. Um, and now that I knew what it was, we can help him along in life. And now I've known Dan for how many years? Oh boy, it's, I don't know, about six, seven, eight years. Yeah, it's been the, a couple of years. The changes in him are remarkable because he had so much anxiety and he still does have anxiety, but yes. he can manage it so much better. But I mean, you used to have problems even getting him to focus. Absolutely, just dropping him off. Yeah. Um, just having him be away from me again. I was homeschooling him because he was like a tick to me. He yep. wouldn't let me go. Um, and when I dropped him off to you, we would drive over an hour just to bring him to your facility. Um, and often I would stay for about an hour trying to ease that transition into your facility. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it wouldn't. We'd get back in the car and drive back home. But gradually over weeks, um, he got more comfortable there, um, especially if he knew he was a little bit older than some of the other kids and could actually help the little right. kids. And once, once he knew he could help someone, then he very easily went for me to use. And, so. and that's, that will come up again here today because they do like to help. And, mm. and now he, I, I call him Joe Cool because oh. <laughs> he is just so relaxed. And even though he is anxious, you can, he's just so much more available and willing to do things. And Focus has taught him how to deal with his anxiety in other ways than he did when he pr presented with you he's many so, years ago. He's so happy. He yeah, is. That, that's he what is. I enjoy seeing. He is. Now, thank you. If you had to pick, if well, this is what we do at Focus, your appreciation, your high point, and your low point. If mm -hmm. you had to pick those about having a child on the spectrum, what mm -hmm. would your appreciation be? Um, his individuality. Um, it's just he's so sweet and so special, um, and he's got so much to offer. Yeah. He has so many good intentions. It's just it's a blessing to see him strive for it and overcome all those obstacles that I know is in his way due mm -hmm. to his Asperger's, but yet he still manages to accomplish his goals. Yep. So for that, I'm very proud and, and that's a high point for me. Okay. Uh, was that your high point or your appreciation? That's my appreciation and my high point. It's just his uniqueness and his ability to keep on 
yeah. keep it on. Um, Absolutely. In spite of his obstacles. Absolutely. And what would a low point be? Um, it's been, I've not had a lot of low points lately mm -hmm. as he's older, but when he was younger and first diagnosed, it was really difficult for me to understand and put into context the behavior I was seeing from him and what was going on in his mind that brought that to the surface. And how easily it seemed to be triggered, his frustration and his anxiety. I felt like I was walking on eggshells in my own home. Um, if we hit a little bump in the road for the day, for the schedule for the day, mm -hmm. he was in a tailspin for the rest of the day and just couldn't seem to get over that. Um, now he's, he's much better about that. So I'd have to say my low point was the unpredictability of mm -hmm. it and not knowing how to um, respond to that and help him along. So it tapped into your mother sense of motherness and, and that you couldn't solve you didn't you didn't one you didn't know what was causing these problems mm -hmm. and two you didn't necessarily know what to do about them and absolutely, they, yeah. they could come on so quickly absolutely well he's he's just a he's oh. an awesome kid and you've done a great job um, being a parent oh and, thank you thank and, you uh, we're gonna get more into strategies afterwards but now we're gonna go to Sharon miss Sharon who is Alex's mom, um, who you guys have seen Alex on most of most of the shows, and um, so what? How how did you find out that Alex was on the autism spectrum? And and Dan is at, I shouldn't do that. At Dan is Asperger's, but Alex is um, straight classic autism. Yeah, actually, Alex wasn't diagnosed with autism until he was five. It wasn't until he actually got into the kindergarten classroom setting that it was clear. The first day of kindergarten, it was like a slap in the face to me. He was under the table, hiding, covering his ears, crying. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, who's this autistic kid I brought to school with me today? Mm -hmm. And even the teacher recognized there were issues right away. And we started the testing basically the next day, um, immediately in kindergarten. And I had been home with him. And we had a pretty routine schedule, which worked very well for him until he went to kindergarten. He has an older brother that's almost four years older, and he was a good role model. And we did things pretty much the same way every day. Um, I incorporated a lot of physical activity throughout the day, which turns out to be extremely important for Alex. And I just thought it was because he was a boy and he had so much energy and he needed to get it out. And luckily for me, in the beginning years, his passion was reading and words. So he was, you know, right where he should be when he went to kindergarten, and it was the social part that was so difficult for him. He had been in preschool with 10 kids before that, and he had even gone to speech therapy the year before kindergarten just for articulation. And the woman who saw him said that he was up to um, where he should be within two months, and she kept him in the group because he was such a good role model for the other two kids. So I thought, wow, he's doing great. And it wasn't until that first day of kindergarten when there were so many kids in the classroom and it was just a new setting that he really showed his autism. And we started the testing and it was about six months later that he had a long list of diagnoses and I said, isn't this actually autism? Yep. And they hesitated to give him the label but then they said, yes, if he has all these characteristics, mm -hmm. we would call it autism. And that's when he started with speech therapy and occupational therapy. And other things like that. And, um, and one of the things that I know that you, you and were very honest with Alex and always talked about autism and mm -hmm. so it, it came as um, sort of it was easy for him to understand because it wasn't anything that was kept in the dark or yeah. you know in, and it, it's now something he's proud of. It, for a yeah. while he did not like having autism but now he's kind of grown into it and and really likes it. Yeah. Um, what, what, if you had to think about what your appreciation, high point, low point for being a parent of a child on the spectrum, what would, what would you say? I would say, and this might be the same even if he wasn't on the spectrum, but he's a very sweet, kind um, teenager and he works extremely hard. Um, he tries his best to do a good job and he wants to be a good teenager. So he works really hard at that and I'm proud at you know, how much he is able mm -hmm. to do and how hard he tries. Um, high points, there's always something new. He's always learning something new. He's always making progress. Um, the low point is the unpredictability of 
that progress. Sometimes you think you've overcome something and then you turn around and it's back. Or just when you think you've gotten to the next level, something else turns up. And I think it really helps if you look at it as a new challenge. Oh, now we're going to work on this. Mm, how am I going to mm -hmm. figure this one out? How can we change this? So that turns the low point into a challenge and a more positive thing. And I always look at his behavior. He's had a lot of aggressive issues, <laughs> problems throughout the years. They're m very um, much less than they used to be. But occasionally, he's still aggressive now. And that's something that's a big issue. I think probably the biggest issue for parents with autistic kids is dealing with the aggressive behavior, mm -hmm. getting rid of the aggressive behavior. And I think with Alex, because he's had so many different issues with his behavior, I always look at that as a part of the autism. And that way I have a lot more patience with him and I'm able, able to deal with what's causing the behavior instead of getting angry or upset about the behavior itself. What's causing that? What in the autism, what in the environment is making this happen now and how can I change that and how can I deal with and, it? And I know that you are on a lot of our panels when we go across the, the state and that is something that comes back in our feedback is that that, that that phrase that you said is, is you know, I, I assume that everything comes from his, his autism. And that's not an excuse for his behavior, but it's a way for you to understand the behavior and to keep your feelings out of, out of that. And that's been really helpful to other parents. And, and I think it really shows with, with Alex, too. And, and what I love about Alex is that he is okay about you talking about him. You yeah. can talk about anything in front of Alex, he and he listens, and he doesn't, he doesn't get upset because he seems to understand that we're trying to help people mm -hmm. and that he's, he's not ashamed of anything that he's done. I mean, he, some of it he doesn't like and wishes it would go away, but he's so open about you being <coughs> so open about him, and I, I really appreciate that for both of you because it really helps um, parents learn learn a lot yeah. and he'll call it his autism mania he goes it, yeah that was my autism mania I had trouble with that mm -hmm. and now I'm working on yeah. it now I'm able to do this so I think looking at it as a part of the autism takes some of the pressure off him too yeah. because he looks at how can we work with that how can we change that he also sees from being on the panel that he has so much in common with everyone else and I think that that's true for for Dan and for everyone that's been on the that's been on the panel or a part of the nutmeg. Edie, yes. you all should know that Edie is the mother of Lucas, who is like one of the stars of uh, the Focus program. He's the mentoring. He, we did not let Lucas be on as a co-host today, even though he, was, he really wanted to because he wants to know what you're going to say about him, right? He wants to censor what I might say. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Lucas's mom. And how did you, you knew something was different when he was born? When he was born. Um, I knew when he was a couple of months old that there were vision problems and I couldn't convince anybody because he was a couple of months old. But I'm an occupational therapist and I worked with severely handicapped kids and so he ended up, when he went to school, he ended up under BESBY, Services for Blind and Visual Handicap. So he always had an IEP. So to me that meant that if he had issues in school, um, you know, we had a way to address them. I never thought about autism. To me, I have a cousin who's autistic, so to me, autism was the hand flapping, the lack of communication, um, the whole nine yard kind of things. And Luke, you know, he was always unique in that people would ask me, what kind of an accent does he have? What is that? <laughs> but he always spoke clearly. He always spoke in full sentences. Started doing that when he was two. Um, in fact, I flew somewhere with him just, I flew to North Carolina with him just before he turned two, and the woman at the um, travel agency told me to bring his passport because I wasn't buying him a ticket. No one would believe that he was under two if they heard him speak. <laughs> so, so I had to do that. But we didn't find out till he was 10. And um, how we found out was the school psychologist happened to read an article on Asperger's and said to me, look, 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 I think this is Luke. We've got to have him tested. And, yep. I, and I thought, well, who cares? Right? Yep. But Eventually, we did have to. We did that for a few reasons, and it turned out he does have Asperger's. And you know, the the good piece of that was that, and the strange piece of it at the same time, to me, he was a unique individual, and I thought he was great. Of course, there were a few things that were difficult, but 
I felt that the school should just take him as he is and do what they had mm -hmm. to do. But it wasn't until he actually got labeled that, that they were willing to do that. It was like a light switch. It was like, you know, they all thought he was a great kid, but they weren't going to put up with this, that, and the other thing. All of a sudden, he's labeled Asperger's, and oh, okay, mm -hmm. now we'll, we'll t now it's okay. Mm -hmm. Now we'll work with him. And I, you know, to me, it's a shame because whether he had Asperger's or not, whether a child has a label mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. why should you have to label a child, whether they have one or not, to that's, get what they need? That's what one of the parents, at, we, when we spoke at the Learning Disability Association, they said it, it's too bad that we have to label kids in order for them to get, to get services. But unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And, and it can work. It works in strange ways through the school year. When he was in the ninth grade, shortly after we you know, found you, um, he had a teacher, he was in college level classes, because he's bright. Mm. And he had a teacher in, I think it was science, who just was not real specific. He would give assignments and like, you build a spaceship and an alien and you're going to get marked on it. Well, what's it supposed to include? Luke has to know, and I imagine I would have to know. What are you grading on? What does it have to include? You know, give me the specifics. And he would say, um, you know, I expect them to be independent. He's in a college level course. He needs mm -hmm. to be independent. Mm -hmm. And we would say, but he has Asperger's. These are what, you know, his, this is what his IEP says. You have to accommodate. Well, if he's in a, this is what we do. And there was not the willingness to accommodate. Mm -hmm. So we ended up going to the head of the department and got the accommodations. Which but were required by law, but. By law to give, but so it, on the one hand, in grade school, the diagnosis helped him because all of a sudden, yes, they were willing to give him what he needed. On the other hand, there were people in high school who couldn't reconcile the fact that here's a bright child student who looks very normal, it is, to me, he's normal, you know, and yet he needs a few accommodations and able to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so it, um, you know, you really have to work. I think part of it was that back then, Asperger's was a new thing. Luke is 24. He's almost 25. And so we were among the first, and no one had heard of it. Now there's so many autistic kids that, that the teachers... One out of 93 is what they're saying. And at least they're more willing to work with them now. What would you say would be your appreciation, high point and low point, of being yeah. the mother of Lucas? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly the high point... I think it's a high point is that I'm no longer introduced as myself. I'm always introduced as Lucas's mom. <laughs> so, so in some ways, that's a high point. Um, I don't really have a low point for myself. I think if I had a low point, it would be that there are some social issues that he still struggles with that bother yeah. him. Yeah. Um, the hardest thing for me was when he was younger, if I wanted to go someplace he didn't want to go. It was very difficult, first of all, to get him there and then keep him there because he would mm. just leave. Yep. Um, but I think what I most appreciate is that he is just a really caring, compassionate, kind-hearted person and he's always been unique, which is something that I treasure, that um, you know, he doesn't follow the crowd. He does what he believes is right for him. Mm -hmm. and what he needs to do and you know he doesn't worry about what Joe and Sue and whoever are doing. I think that's a wonderful thing. It's interesting yeah. to me that all three of you talk, when people think about kids on the autism spectrum, they're not thinking about kids who are kind and then sweet and caring because they often see, you know, peop kids that have trouble with relationships and, you know, trouble, you know, communicating and processing. But that is really their nature, is it, when, once you are able to have developed the trust and developed the relationships and learn how to communicate with your child and, and help them with the transitions and this and that. They really are the most loyal, sweet, pure individuals. Now, I do not have anybody with autism in my family. I fell in love with the autism spectrum just because of who they are and because I do respect that their honesty. I, I like it because they just give it to you straight. And, <laughs> and for me, who I have, I have problems understanding. I don't like to do cues and stuff. I like you to be direct with me. I can count on that with these guys. They, they don't mince words. They let you know 
exactly what's what. Like when I asked Alex a question on, on one of the shows, he goes, he had his head was down and then he looked up, he gave an answer and he goes, and that's that, you know, like I'm done. <laughs> but that was yeah. his very first time. But it's, they are so loyal and so loving. And mm -hmm. when I'm with them, I just, it's just like heaven for me. Um, I'm going to ask about if you had any periods of grieving when you, when you when mm. did did you did because a lot of parents you know I think that's something that you have to to go through and I don't know if if did you Kim did you have moments of grieving when you were yeah um, yeah early on way before he was diagnosed with the Asperger's back when he was diagnosed with uh, uh, learning disabilities and uh, learning delays and. Um, the uh, sensory integration disorder, the diagnoses just seemed to mount and mount and mount and mount. And it was so frustrating for me as a mom who worked full time and, and he was the only child we could have um, biologically. It was, he took all our time, all our efforts, and some days I just didn't feel like I was making any groundwork. And it was frustrating and a little, yeah, I think I had to kind of go through a little you know, pity party. Did, did, um, did you feel guilty? Or just the grieving? I, I think... Uh, Not just the grieving. grieving right. No, I understand. Um, a part of me does feel guilty. I always think, uh, what did I do that may have contributed to his autism? Um, because I see him struggle in life and he's trying so hard and sometimes it just doesn't work out the way he's trying to have it work out. And I know it's frustrating and it's going to be a lifelong challenge for him. And I sometimes wonder, yeah, if there was something I could have done or something, something I didn't do that I should have done or I did and I shouldn't have while I was pregnant. Um, Which I think is normal. But, yeah, absolutely. Normal for anybody that has anybody that's different. But right, but you can't get stuck on that for too long stuck. because it's the here and now. And this is, this is what you know we've been blessed with, and, and he is. He's a blessing. And, yes, he is. Um, and you just work with what you have now. But yes, there, there was a moment in time there when all the labels just seemed to be piling up, and none of them seemed to exactly hit the mark. Right. That's why I think I was so excited when he was finally diagnosed with Asperger's. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Kim. Sure. Sharon, what about you? People often ask me that, and I know it's common that there should be some kind of grieving process, but I think because I came from it the other way, and I kept saying to the doctors, isn't this autism? Wouldn't you call this autism? Doesn't that seem like autism? All these things put together. And then finally they said yes. I think it was almost like a relief to me. The one time I remember was really difficult, and one time I cried over the diagnosis was when I called my parents, and I couldn't see them in person. We were living in California, and they were here in Connecticut, and I called my parents to tell them that we had the diagnosis, and I think that was the single hardest time for me because as a parent, I realized that I was their child, and how were yep. they going to react to this, knowing mm. that my life would be different and not what I expected, and... Um, <coughs> That, that was the single toughest time, I think. And they are phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we Alex. moved back here because we wanted to spend more time with the family and yeah. be closer to the family. And he is crazy about his grandparents and his aunts and uncles and cousins. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, all of you have basically come to see it as a blessing um, in, in, you know, a, in, in working through things. Did you, you, did you grieve at all? I, at the time, I am an occupational therapist, and at the time I was working with severely mentally and physically handicapped kids. You know, kids who couldn't move were severely developmentally delayed, um, vision problems, any kind of problem you can imagine, multiple handicaps. So with Luke, um, the problem, and I thought for a time that he was having seizures and that all he could see was light and dark. So when I had that checked out, and they didn't confirm the seizures, which I still think he had, but they stopped, fortunately. And they found that he could see. It was just nystagmus. So that, to me, was such a relief that he could see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he wasn't diagnosed till he was 10. And I had an autistic cousin who was truly autistic, what they would now call childhood disintegrative disorder. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I don't know. I know he, it just didn't mean anything to me. It was like, okay, he's got mm -hmm. a label. Mm -hmm. He's still Luke, 
yeah. and and um, I, I just always thought it was very nice that he was unique. I, it bothered him a lot more because of the social issues, but to me, you know, grieving or feeling guilty or anything was never a piece of it. Part of what your struggle was was getting your husband to accept that there was an that, issue. That was a huge struggle, and especially um, I can remember teasing was a big thing. He didn't understand teasing, and I knew that he didn't. Mm -hmm. I knew that he thought um, if you said something to him, you meant it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get my husband to understand that. He would say to me, well, then we just need to tease him till he gets used to it. Mm -hmm. And I'd go, oh, no, oh. no, 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 no. But when he finally heard it from you, then it was okay. Hearing me, it was just, you know, mom, mom is being too kind, mom has let him get away with it. And um, hearing it from a professional really made a huge difference. Yep. And the, the funny thing is that they have a really good relationship now, and a good part of it is because of what you did with teaching Luke, because Luke is so compassionate a person, and he wants to please. He won't be walked over, but he does want to please. And so because of his wanting to, that's how he and his dad developed a much closer relationship. And actually, Dad, I forget what Lucas did, but Dad wrote some a letter to Lucas saying that he was his hero. Oh, when we did the radio show. Oh, well, that's right. that's sweet. It, it is, and, and that meant so much to, it meant so much to Lucas. And, uh, but it's, unfortunately, our time is just about up, and it has, it, fast. it went fast, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. We have so much more to say, but we are out of time. We wanted to be able to give you some tips and this and that, but you know what? You guys are just going to have to stay tuned for another episode, <laughs> and we'll see what we can do. Um, thank you.